Right. Welcome everybody to this webinar titled The Social Contract and the Role of Social Protection in Building Trust in Government and Strengthening the Nation State. This is organized by socialprotection.org in cooperation with Development Pathways and ACT Church of Sweden. My name is Gunnel Axelsson Nykander. I'm a policy advisor at ACT Church of Sweden. I will facilitate the session. And uh, I should mention that ACT Church of Sweden is a faith and human rights based development organization and member of the ACT Alliance. Second picture, please. Uh, two years ago, ACT Church of Sweden and Development Pathways published another report together, Hit and Miss, it was called, and it exposed the limitations of poverty targeted social protection programs in terms of their development effectiveness. In short, uh, it showed that poverty, target, poverty targeted programs fail, often to a very high degree, to reach the intended target groups. At the same time, the research demonstrated the effectiveness of universal schemes in reaching those living in extreme poverty. However, the, uh, the discussion on effectiveness of the individual programs tend to be technical among social protection specialists. With this new report, we aim at bringing the discussion on universal and targeting to a broader debate on how to design how the design of social policy can influence trust and thereby the social contract and possibilities to, to mobilize domestic resources, build democracy and peace building. Uh, and the core issue, as you can see on the screen, is the social contract or the virtuous circle of trust, increased government revenues and higher quality public services. And the paper argues that the best and easiest means of building trust in government is through investing in universal social security. And you will see a link to the paper in the chat box. Uh, we have three eminent speakers with us today. First, uh, Dr. Stephen Kidd, who is the main author of the report. And please, the next slide. Uh, he's a principal social prote protection specialist and founder of Development Pathways. Uh, before Development Pathways was started 10 years ago, he was the Director of Policy at HelpAge International. He has led DFID's social protection team and lectured uh, in social anthropology at the University of Edinburgh. And he has worked in more than 30 countries across the world. And then we have two speakers who will comment on the report from their specific perspectives. Um, first, Professor Bo Rothstein holds the August Dress Chair in the Political Science at University of Gothenburg and is co-founder of the Quality of Government Institute at the same department. He has also been visiting professor at a number of other universities, universities, including University of Oxford, Collegium Budapest for Advanced Study, Harvard University, Cornell, Stellenbosch in, the South, in South Africa and others. Uh, and he has written extensively about corruption, the quality of government and the role of trust. And finally, Professor Baxin Molineux is Professor of Sociology at the Institute of the Americas at University College of London. And she's written ex widely in the fields of gender studies, human rights, poverty and development policy, and also authored books on Latin America, Ethiopia and South Yemen. Uh, and she has served as a senior consultant to UN agencies, NGOs and governments, and recently served as a research director of multi-country investigations into social protection. Uh, and finally, a few words of myself. I was trained in economic history and environmental economics and has been working as a policy advisor at Church of Sweden since 2002. And after working a lot on issues like food security and climate change, about 10 years ago, uh, we initiated the work on social protection, which was kicked off in 2012 with the publication of the report Cash, Cash in the Hand. Um, there will be, of course, a Q&A se session uh, in the end of the webinar, but we encourage you to send your questions and comments throughout the webinar, and please do that in the Q&A box. Please also state who you were, are or work for, and if your question is directed at someone specific. We will give space for a maximum two questions directly after each intervention, and, and of course, try to respond to as many as possible in the end of the webinar. So, everybody on board, I now turn to our first speaker, Stephen. Please, the floor is yours for 15 minutes. Okay, um, thanks very much, Gunnel. Um, I hope everybody can see my screen. So, what I want to do is give a very, very brief summary of what was in the um, 
uh, in the in the paper that we did around um, social security or social protection and is running either strengthening or undermining trust in in government i think you know the the first point to make is that you know a, a strong social contract is at the core of any successful nation state and 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 you know for any government anywhere in the world and for international development one of the key objectives if not the key objective that we need to be able to achieve in is a strong social contract because that will allow many other things to happen in terms of provision of public services and economic growth if we don't have that then we're not going to have any success and this is what at the heart of many of the problems of many of the fragile states across the world is a very weak social contract and therefore we need to do what we can to strengthen that by social contract what we mean is the relationship between the citizens of a country and their in their government the citizens contribute to the nation through their taxes and uh, the government in turn should provide them with good quality public services, preferably universal public services based on their entitlements, their rights to those um, services that they get from the taxes that they pay into government. And that builds a social contract between the citizens and government. And that's what we need to, to achieve. However, if governments fail in terms of their part of the contract and do not provide good quality public services, what will happen is that the social contract will fall apart and weaken. People will stop contributing to the nation. We see in many countries, people try to, to, to not pay taxes and try to avoid taxes because they complain about the low quality of public services. And we end up with a fracture, a break in the social contract, which are the most extreme cases where we see in many fragile states, such as Somalia or Afghanistan, um, we can find that there is no real strong social contract. And it's difficult then to be successful in anything that we do. Good sign of a social contract, a strong social contract, is the level of government revenues. How much are people actually contributing as part of their, part, uh, uh, their, their role in the social contract? And this shows the percent, the government revenues across a wide range of um, countries in the global south to see what percentage of overall GDP is given in tax. And we can see that in most countries, it's quite low. And most we, many it's below 20% of GDP. Now you might think that's, you know, um, you know, you may not know whether that's good or bad. I mean, one thing we can see is that some countries it's really, really low, 10% or, or less countries, even like Bangladesh um, are only at around 10% of GDP. But what we find in, 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 in uh, higher income countries is much higher levels. In Anglo-Saxon countries, it's around 35% of, of GDP and in many other countries, particularly Nordic countries and other European countries, we're getting up to 50% of GDP people are paying in tax, but receiving in turn high quality public services as part of a strong social contract. Now, how do we build this social contract and this strong social contract to then generate these high levels of government revenues? There's a really interesting publication by Sweden's Ministry of Finance, which I think was what makes it particularly interesting coming from a Ministry of Finance, where it really highlights um, the importance of investing in universal public services, including um, universal social security or social protection, and that that's critical to um, generating uh, the, 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 um, the strong social contract and trust in government. And if we have means tested or poverty targeted benefits, we'll end up undermining the, uh, um, the, the, the social contract. So what we see in terms of, you know, if we services that are provided by citizens to build a strong social contract, we want services where there's no corruption. Um, so people can trust the services. We want services where people can receive it when they need it. Um, and therefore, you can achieve that with a universal program. The service must be delivered impartially. And of course, universal public services and social security being delivered to everybody on an equal basis, this, irrespective of who they are, uh, means that they're delivered impartially. But service delivery must respect people's dignity. And often we find in many poverty targeted programs that this doesn't happen. Now. The problem that we see, I think, across many um, countries in the global south, which are dominated, the, the model of social protection that is used is often one that is what I would call poor relief programs for the poor, 
And these programs for the poor are delivered in often a very poor quality. One of the key ways, signs of a very poor quality delivery is the targeting errors. And we can see in this graph from an earlier publication that we did with the uh, Church of Sweden um, on targeting errors in poverty targeted programs across the global south that exclusion errors are very, very high. So even when you're targeting the program at the very poorest, the majority of people are losing out. So the best exclusion errors were 44% that we found in Brazil, um, but going up to almost everybody, 197% of people who intended recipients being excluded. And often the way in which it's delivered by putting out um, you know, um, uh, lists of people or through community-based targeting, et cetera, where um, people um, have to talk publicly uh, about things is often uh, demeaning for people and undermines their, their dignity. And these programs are likely to uh, undermine um, um, trust in government across the world. This is absolutely what we shouldn't be doing because our priority should be to build that trust, not undermine it through the poverty targeted programs that the Ministry of Finance in Sweden warn us against. One particularly problematic targeting mechanism is the proxy means test. I think I don't have time to go into this, but this is where this is pushed a lot throughout many uh, countries now in the world. It's linked to these, these social registries that have been developed in many, many countries where um, governments go out and try to measure uh, the welfare of, of, their, of their citizens by looking at particular assets and proxies. But it's a very inaccurate targeting mechanism. This graph is trying to, is showing in uh, in, um, uh, in in Bangladesh, uh, the, the the differences between um, if we look on the y-axis, um, where people would be ranked from poorest to richest on the on the y-axis, and where they're predicted to be in terms of their uh, income ranking on the x-axis, according to the proxy means test. Now, if it was perfectly targeted, as it should, should say every dot is a household. If it was perfectly targeted all these uh, households would be lined up across the orange line. But as we see, that's not the case. We have this big scatter, very arbitrary targeting. And this kind of arbitrary targeting is absolutely going to undermine trust of citizens in their, in, in their public services. And then we see this many, there's lots of evidence of how this undermines trust. There was a proxy means test program that was looked at in Indonesia and the results of this proxy means test targeting that was done in around 2005. And you can see in terms of the results, this is showing the villages in, in Indonesia and, and, and what happened in those villages as a result of the targeting. And you can see, for example, there were protests in almost 35% of, of villages and there were threats to village officials in 15%. This was showing it was actively undermining trust in the national government in Indonesia. And one has to question, why would a government want to deliver programs that actively undermine trust? And so what we see is that a vicious circle is developed in many countries in the global south by putting in place poor quality, poor relief programs, the kind of conditional cash transfers that we find or, or productive safety net programs. We build low trust in government, a weak social contract, an unwillingness to pay taxes, and therefore low government revenues, which means that we can't deliver good quality public services, never mind in, 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 uh, in our social security programs, but in health and education and infrastructure. It's really interesting then to look, how do countries get to where they are? Those countries have strong social contracts or stronger social contracts nowadays. How did they get there? And this is looking at three European countries, France, Sweden, and, and United Kingdom historically. It's looking at the percentage of GDP that they had in their government revenues. And we look here in the first years between 1900 and 1940, the level of tax government revenues was very similar to most mid low and middle income countries. It was less than 20% of GDP. That was the situation prior to the Second World War in these countries. And we know what happened. It was the Second World War it was the rise of fascism, conflict, high levels of inequality, high levels of poverty. The Second World War was a point at which at, at this point, because of a history of war and, and social conf and conflict in Europe, countries in Western Europe 
made a, a significant change in paradigm. They moved from programs which previously been dominated by programs for the poor and, and poverty target programs to much more universal services and universal social security, such as universal pensions and universal child benefits. And we could see that there was a significant increase in the levels of government revenue as, as, as citizens began to respond and began to pay more and more taxes. So what was delivered was a virtuous circle, not the vicious circle that we find in many countries in the global south of governments putting in place good quality universal public services, including social security, building greater trust in government, a stronger social contract, greater willingness among citizens to pay taxes because they were going to benefit from the services, if a higher government revenues, and therefore governments could put in place even more and better quality universal public services. And that's why we saw a major transformation in Europe and many high income countries in terms of the quality of life for people. The challenge is in many low uh, countries in the global south, it, in, you know, the governments have a major challenge in building this, this trust, particularly in fragile states, but across most countries in the global south. You could hopefully do it by investing in health, but health systems take a long time to build and, and, and citizens may not see the results. And so they may not, you may not be able to build that trust quickly. Similar for education. It's very difficult to build a strong education system in, in, immediately to get that trust built. It's different when you have uh, social security programs where you give cash to, 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 to people, they can see immediately that they're receiving something from government in return for the taxes that they're paying and universal social security transfers can have a, a really important role in building this trust so for example universal child benefit or universal old age pension they're very easy to design and very easy for governments to deliver because they require very minimal administrative capacity and so Governments could make a decision to implement a universal old age pension, a universal child benefit, and deliver a high quality scheme within one year in virtually every country in the, in the world, this is possible. By doing that, citizens will receive that cash on an equitable basis with everybody else, and trust will be built in government as people receive the same amount every month. And as that trust is built, this virtual circle commences and over time the social contract will be strengthened, higher government revenues can be generated and therefore governments can then expand the social security system and have more revenues, more revenue to in invest in health, education, infrastructure, etc. over time and, and really move forward um, in a much stronger basis than ha happens uh, currently. And this is really important for all countries in the global south, particularly in fragile states, is to shift the thinking from targeting the poor in a, what appears to be an unfair and arbitrary manner to deliver these universal services that build this trust, which is what we absolutely need to be doing as a priority. Now, just doing some quick calculations where we could look at a range of countries where you put in place a universal child benefit, a universal disability benefits and universal old age pensions. You can see in these countries, this has shown the level of coverage. You would in most countries in the global south reach over around 90% of households with just those three programs. 90% of households receiving cash is a strong sign that government cares for you. Government is there for you. And therefore, you will build the trust and build the social contract, which you cannot achieve with these programs targeted at the poorest 10% or 20% because everybody feels excluded. So what we need to do is move from this kind of model of poor relief that it dominates in so many countries in the global south, where we have social insurance programs for the rich, targeted programs for those who are very poor, but many people in the middle, the missing middle, missing out and not feeling this link that government cares for them to now build a social security model where we have multi-tiered benefits, both social insurance and tax finance to citizens finance schemes that everybody can, can access on an equal basis. That's how we'll build trust. Uh, just because I'm Jeez. running out of time, yep. I'll, I'll just finish and just say, look, we have some evidence also from around uh, countries in, um, in, low and middle in, in low and middle income countries where they put in place inclusive or high coverage or universal programs and have begun to deliver peace. South Africa, by expanding its old age pension, child benefits, brought about peace 
after the fall of, a, of apartheid. And we see similar things that have happened with universal schemes, often universal pensions in Timor-Leste, Georgia, Mauritius, and a universal basic income in Iran. So we see the evidence, not just in Europe, but we see the evidence in many countries, which only a few years ago were fragile states, but are now moving forward. And we see also many of these countries that actually in the blue, we see what the percentage of the, you, the tax revenues were. There, just a few seconds more. Yeah, in 2000. Mm -hmm. And we see what they are now in 2019. In most of these countries, we've had a large increase. We can't say the causality that that's because of the universal programs, but it's interesting to see that. And finally, I think I just want to look at South Asia very quickly and to see the pattern in South Asia. Here is just shown the level of government revenues from 2000 to 2020 across four countries in South Asia where poverty targeting dominates. There's been no increase in those, four, those countries over those years in terms of the increase in government revenues. The one country where we see a difference is Nepal. And Nepal is the one country in South Asia where we've had universal benefits that have been put in place through a universal pension that has grown over time helped bring about uh, uh, the end of the civil war in, in, in Nepal and through a peace dividend continued to, to expand and began potentially to build this trust and that we see the result in higher government revenues. So I'll just finish there. And I think it's, we, we, we really need to just to stress, we really need to think about this in the work that we do in all our work in countries, do we want to undermine or do we want to strengthen and build trust? And I think we want to build trust, build a social contract, and a way to do that easily and quickly is through the provision of universal social security. So thank, thank you very much, Stephen. And uh, before I let you, uh, they are we actually received two questions, uh, and the first one is about corruption. What about corruption? You painted a quite uh, positive image, but many of developing countries have big issues related to corruption in the government. How to deal with this challenge? It's from an anonymous attendee. Um, yeah, I think the, the corruption is much more likely to happen with poverty targeted programs. I mean, we see corruption, there's many examples in South Asia, the poverty targeted programs there are full of corruption of, of being used by local officials in terms of the, the, the targeting. And we, see, and we see also in other proxy means tests in the same way, it's very easy. If you lie, then you might, you'll be rewarded with the benefits. If you lie about your benefits, that's the problem with poverty targeted programs. With universal programs, it's much more difficult to have corruption because everybody knows what they should be getting they know they have it as a right. If you know you're meant to get $10 a month and you don't get those $10, then you know there's corruption and you can take action. And we find much, much lower levels of corruption with universal benefits. Thank you. And uh, we've got some other questions relating to other uh, stakeholders and responsibilities of uh, other uh, than the state. There's one about the role of employers, but also about uh, non-state actors like uh, NGOs, like does the relationship between quality universal public services and trust in government hold if the services are delivered by non-state actors? Say well, for I example, think, through, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think if a uh, you know, social insurance scheme is delivered by government, um, you know, it's, 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 it's funded from contribution, but it's still delivered by government because these are often parastatal uh, government organizations. But if citizens feel, which was what we see in many countries, that services are coming from NGOs with international funding, that's not going to build trust in government. That's probably going to undermine trust. So we have to get behind government delivery of services to build that national social contract. There's still a role for NGOs, obviously, to, to, to do it. But to build the trust, services have to be coming from, uh, from government on an equitable and fair basis to all citizens. Thank you very much. And um, I now turn to our second speaker, Uwe Rothstein, please. The floor is yours for 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm here to comment on this report. And I can say from the start that this report is music to my ears. I've been arguing for the uh, legitimacy creating effects of universal regimes since I think I wrote my first piece of this in 1994 or something. But I, what I didn't do then was to, I, I tried to compare 
uh, uh, the Northern European countries with the Anglo-Saxon countries. I think it's really excellent that this is brought very clearly to the uh, developing world in this way. So, and I, is, of course, especially uh, I think that the critique of the means tested policies and this means testing by proxy is very, very good. Uh, and uh, I also think that the critique, and it, that could have been sharpened of uh, the neoliberal economics, how uh, this has played out, because also in many of the uh, uh, developed countries, uh, this has uh, created problems for universalism. Uh, I also, of course, like the social contract approach. And uh, let's see if I can do it here. Uh, can you see my screen? This is a book that I've, uh, is just going to be published uh, in about six weeks, Controlling Corruption, the Social Contract Approach by Oxford University Press. And I think this is also right on the money what you say about the, the social contract, how important it is and how important the relation between social trust, taxation and reasonably fair, uncorrupt, impartial government institutions is for creating development. Um, let's see. Do you see my screen? Hello. Yes. yes. Oh, okay, good. Um, I cannot get to the next one. Hmm. What I think you may be missing here, or that could have been more developed, is... Um, hmm. Now we I'm see this, your screen. We see, or we saw it at least. Uh, okay. The this table. is a figure. If you can see it, I cannot see it. Yes, we can see the rest redistributed logic of universal social policies. Yeah, what I think is somewhat missing from this report is the strong redistributive effect of universalism. One reason that many policy people and people in developing organizations and, and ordinary people uh, are in favor of means-tested policies for the poor is that they have this idea that in order to create redistribution, you should tax uh, the well-to-do, the rich, and give to the poor. And that seems to have an intuitive logic, but empirics shows a very different picture. The, the more you try to do this, the less redistribution you will get. And the reason is simple, uh, and that is also uh, pointed out in the report, if the middle class don't get anything from the system, they will not pay taxes. Uh, I've tried to use a ve this very, very simple figure in order to explain the logic here. So it starts in column A with a society with five groups. They are each 20% of the population. And then you can see that their income you have an income differential of one to five. So the richest group earns five times more than the poorest group. Then what we do is we, we add taxation and uh, you can have taxation progressive, but you can also have it proportional. And I just took the figure 40%. And then we take the money we get in, this 1200 and divide it each equally to each group. And each group then gets 200 and I think 80 or 60. I cannot see it here. And then we sum up. And what you can see from this system is that this is an enormously effective redistributive machine. And the logic is simple. Even if you would say, and there are many high level uh, political economists and philosophers who say you shouldn't have universalists because then everyone gets the same and you do not create redistribution and you do not help the poor. Nothing can be further from the truth. What you see here is that this system actually changes the, the wealth from one to five to one to 
2023. And this is without any progression in the taxation system or any uh, uh, more, more money to the poor people. Everyone gets the same. Uh, and same here is, of course, the trick is done because taxation is usually proportional as a percentage, but what you get in terms of benefits or, or policies are nominal. So I think what should have been added to the report that if you really want to create a redistribution, universal social policies are much more effective than selective. You can also see the political logic here. You can see that there are three, there are two groups that actually economically benefit from the system. That is group D and E. And then you have group C, the middle class. So for, for them, it actually turns the money around. And this is, of course, also the political logic. If you don't have the middle class on board, this will not happen because there is the money and there are the swing voters. So it's very important to include the middle class in these programs. Otherwise, the system will not work. Uh, it has been mentioned, but I think also more could have been pointed that one reason that I think many uh, politicians are in favor of means-tested programs in the developing world is that they create an asset for them, namely people who for various reasons are deemed not eligible by the street level bureaucrats they turn to their elected politicians. And so you get the kind of personalistic, non-programmatic type of politics that we also call clientelism here. And this is of course beneficial for the politician because they can show that they are actually helping individuals in their constituencies. Uh, what I think is uh, not so good in this report is the reference to the Swedish Minister of Finance. What she says is absolutely unoriginal here. The real person behind this policy in the Nordic country is the legendary minister of social affairs between 1932 and 1951, Gustav Müller. And I've written a lot about him. And he created these universal programs in stark opposition to, uh, for example, uh, Gunnar and Alva Myrdal, the famous economist and the famous peace uh, uh, negotiator, both Nobel laureates, because they wanted means-tested support for poor families in kind. And Miller said no to this for exactly the arguments that are presented here. This would create stigmatization of the poor. You would also get a, a, a lot of uh, bureaucratic hasslement with the means-testing but he had one additional argument. He, he came to this in, in, in the 1940s. And he was, a, 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 although he was a strong Democrat and a liberal, he was also a scholar Marxist. And for his big surprise then, what he discovered already then was that the industrial working class was not growing in the North countries. The Social Democrats then thought that the industrial working class would grow and grow and grow, and they would of automatically get more votes by that. What was growing was the middle class. So he deliberately constructed his reforms so as to include middle class people. I think there is also an additional argument for taxation. In our research, based on lots of ethnographic but also uh, quantitative studies, we have found a, a quite interesting thing, namely people in highly corrupt countries do not internalize corruption as something okay. They take a very clear moral stand against corruption. Still, they participate because they feel that they don't have a choice. But we have also asked people in developing countries, if people like you take such a clear moral stand against corruption, why isn't there more protests? In many of these countries, you can actually go take to the street and protest against that enormous corruption uh, that the elite is doing. And then we get a very surprising answer from many of our informants. They say, it's not my money. They hardly pay any taxes. They pay some trade taxes, uh, and, uh, uh, but they don't pay income tax, they don't pay property tax. So they perceive that what the 
economic and political elite is doing by plundering natural resources or stealing from aid money is bad, but it's not their money. And I think uh, this creates, of course, a, a problem for much of the aid that goes into the budgets directly uh, for developing countries because it relieves government for actually taxing their citizens. And if you don't pay tax, you don't perceive that corruption is a bad thing because it's not your money that goes away. So you, you have to have a, a, a stronger uh, taxation system. Lastly, if I have a few more minutes, 70% uh, of the international aid and development money from my country goes to what they define as promoting democracy. And I'm a big fan of democracy, <laughs> make no mistake about that. But the thing is this, we have no evidence that democracy actually increases human well-being. And we have very little that speaks for that democracy will work as a cure against corruption. Uh, it's actually the case that in many countries, not only developing countries, we have a president in the United States, uh, people actually elect corrupt politicians and re-elect them. So what is missing here is, uh, I agree that it's not so easy to uh, build well-functioning educational systems and healthcare systems that that will take some time. But what more money should go to is to strengthen the quality of the public administration, the taxation system, uh, uh, land registers, and so on. Because that is, and the rule of law, of course, because that is what actually have an effect both on lowering corruption and in increasing human wealth. Yeah, these were my points. I, I think, again, I want to congratulate uh, Stephen Kidd and the other authors and the organization. I think this is a really excellent report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bo. And um, looking at the, the questions that have come in, uh, many of them uh, deal with the question of, yes, there are many arguments for, for, for universal, but what about the costs? Uh, how can how can we actually um, mobilize that money, which of course comes back to the, the question of tax. And I'll pick up one question, which is directed to directly to Bo. Uh, very interesting figure. Uh, this question is from Tamara Bokar. Uh, however, the figure assumes that all five groups from richest to poorest actually pay taxes. Nowadays, many of the poorest in the are in the informal economy, meaning they only lack access to social protection, but also don't contribute to the system itself since they don't pay taxes and then how to overcome this hurdle. So really how to, to start this process, I think. Well, I think there is one very good idea in the report and that is that in order to get universal childcare or pension, so you have to register and also register your income. So you can do this at the same time. You will not get uh, universal childcare if you do not register uh, that you have an income. Then comes, of course, my other argument. It is very important to strengthen the capacity of the public administration, not least the, the administration for handling taxation. That is utterly important. I can give you one figure. Most of my American and also British colleagues don't believe what I say. when. We measure here in Sweden which of all the public institutions and authorities that had most confidence in this country. And believe it or not, number one is the tax administration. And that is, of course, and it's also true, it's a very service oriented organization. It's not like the IRS in, in, in the US, for example. So this is what you have to do. You have to make sure that these systems actually perform as they should do. So more money should go to, to, to strengthening the public administration and the quality of the public institutions. This is very hard. I mean, we wrote a report for the Swedish uh, de development agency making this argument. 
uh, uh, it's called making development work the quality of government the quality of government approach um, the minister of finance sorry the minister of development says yeah you're right i believe i believe you your argument but the problem is it's very easy for me to get money from the parliament for promoting democracy it's much much more difficult to get money for for increasing the quality of the public administration so thank you very much both and now i would like to uh, invite uh, maxine please the floor is yours thank you very much and i'm very pleased to hear both of the previous presentations because my talk which is on latin america will be referring to a lot of the points made in the report and taken up and discussed by the two speakers let me just get my powerpoint up for you all. Okay. I hope you can see that. Is that okay? Can you see it? Can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yes, we see it very well. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So um, I call this talk Latin America's steep climb, and I'm going to tell you why it's a steep climb. Most of the countries in Latin America are classified as middle income and three of them, Mexico, Colombia, and Chile, are members of the OECD, the block of quotes, highly developed countries. However, the region stands out for three features. It's very high levels of inequality, the genies of four and five. Let me just... Stephen, you said I had to move my slides along by... Okay, there we are. Okay, good. Um, so Latin America stands out for three regions. It's very high levels of inequality with genies of four and five, as you can see here. The large proportion of people in poverty uh, between well, sometimes more than 30%, but it's about 182 million people and a weak labor market dominated by informal sector jobs. These three factors all have implications for social protection, making it essential on the one hand, but limiting its effectiveness on the other. Latin America, along with South Africa, was a pioneer in the development of anti-poverty cash transfer programs that were directed at improving the life chances of extremely poor children in the global South. South Africa's child grant was set up in the early 90s and Latin America's first conditional cash transfers appeared in Mexico and Brazil a few years later. These were targeted at mothers of extremely poor households to help prevent the intergenerational transmission of poverty by assisting with the expenses of schooling. Over the next decade, cash transfers came to be, my slides are running away. Over the next decade, cash transfers came to be seen as the magic bullet for tackling poverty itself the top priority of the Millennium Development Goals and were rolled out across the global south so that by 2015, more than 1.9 billion people were registered in social safety net programs alone. And the number of countries with a social protection framework grew to 77 with 31 more at the planning stage. And many of those have now been put in place. At the same time, there's been growing support for moving from narrow poverty targeting towards, quotes, progressive categorical universalism, that is, towards extending social protection to include all those in certain vulnerable groups, like children, the disabled, certain ethnic minorities, and of course, the elderly. In fact, a growing number of developing countries are introducing a universal flaw of income security for the elderly, including, um, tax finance pensions. And in 2018, uh, there were 22 schemes in place across the world with others planned, although uh, fewer than 20% of older persons are actually covered. And most are only able to claim at a fairly advanced age, often exceeding the average longevity within the particular demographic. The first wave of cash transfer programs included Bolsa Familia in Brazil and Oportunidades, later called Prospera. They produced measurable results in reducing the level of poverty and increasing children's attendance at schools, 
and at health checks. They were also inexpensive once initial setup costs were absorbed, uh, costing only between one and 2% of GDP. And they were argued to have three multiplier effects. First of all, financial inclusion of the poor, for example, by setting up bank accounts for cash transfer recipients, and in some cases, allowing credit to poor households. A second effect was said to be an extension of citizenship and entitlements to formerly excluded groups through having to register to enter the program that had also entitled them to vote, for example. And thirdly, curbs were placed on the clientelistic manipulation of social protection for political gain by moving to electronic, electronic delivery systems and direct delivery of the cash. Although, as we know, this was not entirely effective because um, political manipulation does continue through other means. By 2015, the expansion of Latin American cash transfer programs was not the only income support initiative undertaken in the region. Some countries, notably Bolivia, Mexico, Brazil, set up non-contributory pensions for rural households a neglected and particularly deprived population that also included a good proportion of indigenous communities. Uruguay, Costa Rica, Chile, and Mexico also introduced con contributory social insurance systems for informal workers, and more attention was paid to tackling the deficit in healthcare, though this included expanding the private sector and creating or furthering the two tiered system. But all this meant that Latin Americans did see an expansion in what Armando Barrientos has termed social guarantees. And that did bring a lot of people at least into some connection with the state, even though this was not really through statutory social rights, except in the case perhaps of Brazil with the constitution of 1988, but something more than existed before for the many people particularly those outside the, the, the formal sector. In some ways, these developments did strengthen the social contract in the sense that these programs were popular with beneficiaries. Initially, at least, they paid dividends in electoral terms to the governments that had set these schemes up, but trust in public institutions not only did not recover from its sharp fall after 2008, when it fell six points, according to the Edelman Trust Barometer, and trust continue to fall through the 2010 to 20, uh, 2020 period in Latin America. Note that this further fall occurred at the same time as we see the rise in state expenditure on social welfare programs. And from 2014, we also see a steady rise in poverty. Now we don't have uh, to look too far to explain this. Um, first of all, social protection programs in Latin America were kept deliberately parsimonious, that is very thinly funded. Coverage was restricted in a variety of ways by admission ceilings and by only targeting the very poorest. For example, Mexico's Prospera had a fixed number of beneficiaries and a waiting list so that new additions had to wait until existing ones graduated. In fact, graduation levels were very low because it could only occur if households reached an income level that took them out of poverty. Given the small size of the stipend, few could manage that. And also the value of cash transfers is set at half or less than half the minimum wage. And this was not tied to inflation. It very rarely is in cash transfer programs so that over time, the real value falls. Now, it's widely held that universal provision is more effective in reducing poverty than selective targeting. It has other positive effects, notably social cohesion, whereas targeting creates social tensions, stigmatizes recipients. Latin America's CT programs were targeted and came with burdensome conditions that mothers had to fulfill in order to remain in the program. They were designed only to tackle the most extreme poverty and this in countries where poverty is extensive and where even up to 60% of the people are poor or are just above the poverty line and therefore vulnerable to being pitched back into poverty at any moment. Targeting was not only too narrow to tackle poverty, but as we have heard, it was also inefficient, leaving as many as 50% of technically eligible households out of account. 
In every evaluation I have done or seen, this problem of exclusion is explained as an effect of poor administration, lack of proper communications to get people to apply for support, and a host of other factors, all of which are certainly pertinent. But in reality, exclusion is built into the fiscal settlement, that is the amount budgeted for the programme. And this amount is in turn constrained in most countries in Latin America by the low tax revenues available to the government. Poor administration and coverage, opaque rules of inclusion, burdensome conditionalities, continuing political manipulation, and a falling real transfer of value all led to a growing disenchantment with cash transfer programs by recipients. The most striking evidence of this is Brazil, where the party of Lula, the Workers' Party, or PT, once strongly supported in the Northeast after Bolsa Familia was rolled out there, voted overwhelmingly for Bolsonaro in the last election. Polls showed that the lower middle classes too, those who had moved up the class order in recent years, but who weren't doing too well economically, started to resent cash transfer programs, reviving old arguments about them making people lazy, the undeserving poor, and so on. More generally, we're seeing more and more signs of social discontent across the region, uh, most strikingly the angry street protests by, started by young people in Chile calling for an end to neoliberal policies and an end to social inequality. As far as social protection is concerned, the lesson here is that if something is worth doing, it's worth doing well. And the evidence shows that it was not always done well and the result fell short of what might have been possible with a greater commitment to addressing the deep social deficits of the region. Here we come to the chicken and egg problem that's already been raised. Latin American political elites have for the most part been slow to tackle some of the great problems of economy and society that afflict their region. Amongst the most evident, apart from inequality and corruption, are weak institutions and in the case of social welfare, there's a pressing need to improve on tax collection in order to support the social sector more effectively. As UNDP and other agencies have argued for years, expenditure on health, education and social protection is not to be seen as a cost, but as a necessary investment. The tax take in the Latin American and Caribbean region is very low in terms of the ratio of tax to GDP. The tax take is around 23%, with great variations across countries. Brazil is high at 40%, but spends a lot of that money on overinflated pensions and other things that are not directly relevant to ordinary people. Guatemala is low at around 12%. Part of the problem in collecting taxes is the high proportion of informality in Latin America, but there are other factors. Tax compliance is a critical element of the social contract and is higher when people trust their governments to provide adequate social goods and good governance in return for paying taxes. Costa Rica is one of the countries with a strong social security sector and high tax compliance. Mexico, a rich country, has very low tax compliance and a weak social sector. The tax systems that prevail in Latin America are regressive, not progressive, hitting the poor and the less well off and leaving the assets of the rich, money, property, likely taxed if taxed at all. This underpins the very high income concentration in Latin America. According to a study by the World Bank, the richest decile of the population in Latin America earns 48% of the total in, in, uh, income, while the poorest 10% of the population earn only 1.6% of the income. In contrast, in developed countries, the top decile receives 29% of total income and the bottom decile earns 2.5%. So obviously, if um, people feel that it's not a fair society and they're not getting much in return, the problem goes on. Another cause of uh, social discontent is that so much of the population lacks the necessary ladders out of poverty, education being a critical one. If you're very poor in Latin America, you will get a very poor education, as evidenced by the data. Take Mexico's Prospera program or Bolsa Familia, 
the longest in existence, so allowing the tracking of students who benefited from the program from a young age. First, students in school showed very low proficiency given their age. Secondly, very few were able to progress to higher education and very few were able to find jobs in the formal sector, let alone good jobs. This all goes to show that much more needs to be done to tackle poverty than a cash transfer. So to finish off with one final point, um, Latin America has been the hardest hit region as far as the COVID pa pandemic has, uh, is concerned, given the head of population and so on. And that's brought a new urgency to scaling up um, the social protection. We need to see much more attention to getting social protection to people on a universal basis in conditions of crisis that we are seeing at the present and which will continue for some years yet. CEPAL, the region's, um, the, the Latin American Economic Commission, has calculated that the region's gains in reducing poverty, already reversing after 2014, will be set back by decades by the pandemic. The region has been very badly affected with the two biggest states, Brazil and Mexico, now world leaders in infection and death by head of population, and the new virus has been discovered in Brazil, or a new mutation, I should say. So it's evident that the countries that have suffered least have been those with stronger social security and health systems, more trust in government, and more equal and integrated economies. We can all hope that these grim lessons will be learned before too long. Thank you very much. And there's my... Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Maxine. And uh, we have a number of questions in the chat. Uh, I can't right now see if there's anyone uh, directed to you. So actually, I will um, first turn to Stephen uh, to hear if you would like to make uh, any comment to, to both and, and Maxine's um, inputs, and then we'll turn back to the Q&A. Um, yeah, thanks. Just very quickly, because I think it's important that we get um, to answer more questions. Um, I mean, in terms of Bo's point about the, you know, the the, um, you know, the paradox of redistribution of universal benefits. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I fully agree with that. We didn't put it in the paper, but I think it's a really, really important point. Is that you know, universal programs are much more effective in addressing inequality and poverty than poverty targeted benefits. But it's also important to, to look at who benefits from a poverty targeted program financially. It's the rich. The rich benefit from poverty targeting. Because, why? Because they pay very low levels of tax as a, because the program is very low cost. So they pay very low levels of tax. And that's why the rich support poverty targeting and elites support poverty targeting. Universal programs are more costly Therefore, the rich are going to have to pay more taxes. So they lose out, in a sense, financially. What they do gain, though, is much more peaceful societies, public services that the better off can also participate in. Those are the benefits that the rich can get. But that's what they misunderstand. But let's remember, it's a critical point. Poverty targeting does not benefit the poor. It benefits the rich. Universal programs benefit the poor and those on middle incomes, less so the rich. Um, and that's really, really important that we often misunderstand this um, uh, because it's counterintuitive. Um, and, I, and I fully agree, I think, with, with Bo's point about the strength and the quality of public administration. And to do that, you've got to pay higher salaries to attract in higher quality people. Many countries don't pay high salaries because they were told to cut taxes and cut spending by the IMF through structural adjustment. And therefore you have civil servants on incredibly low salaries and the talent, talent will not be attracted into government. We need, a, we need this paradigm shift, Universe, invest in universal public services, invest in more government revenues. We can invest also in higher salaries for public servants to attract in higher quality staff and build a, a much stronger public administration. And I think just quickly on the on the point of Latin America, I think it was great what 
Maxine was saying. I mean, for me, I think the tragedy of Latin America is how the left threw away their opportunity. You know, you had the left come into power in, Bolsa, in, in Brazil. What did they do? Put in place Bolsa Familia, a neoliberal program for the very poorest. What's the, it didn't build trust in government. What have we ended up with in Brazil? Bolsonaro, right? Mexico, you know, we've had Prospera. It was there, you know, it didn't do a very good job. Where is it now? It disappeared. It no longer exists because when a left-wing president came in, he had no use for a poverty targeted program. It disappeared. These poverty targeted programs don't, uh, don't last. The left missed out on, on, on this. Who was out on the streets in Chile a couple of years ago? It was those on middle incomes because they were excluded from the system. And we need to get universal programs to support not just the poorest, but those on middle incomes and the wealthy together. And then we'll build a strong contract, uh, so social contract. And perhaps we'll stop people um, coming out into the streets. And the, almost the only country in, 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 in Latin America that put in place universal programs was Bolivia with its universal pension, which of course has much higher levels of investment and is much more effective than any of the conditional cash transfer programs that you find in Latin America. And we have to move away from the myth of Bolsa Familia. I've written a paper about this. But if we look at what has impacts on poverty and inequality in Brazil, it is not also familiar. It is the universal old age pension system. That's what really reduces poverty and inequality in Brazil and has much higher levels of, of in investment. And finally, I think this whole point about collecting taxes, we do enter into this in the paper as, you know, let's use the social security system, something like child benefits because there's rights and responsibilities. We give a child benefit to you if you declare your, ta your, your income, as you do in South Africa to get the child benefit. Once people start getting used to declaring their income as the incentive there is for the child benefit, gradually, once we declare their incomes, they'll get into the tax system. They may be not taxed initially because what they earn is far too little, but they'll get into the system. What we need to do is remember this. We have to get people into the tax system. And if you read the paper, you'll see that a universal child benefit is one potential tool for achieving this and therefore transforming societies. So I'll just stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll now turn to actually the first uh, question in the Q&A box, which I found very interesting. Uh, and. In, in your first picture, I think, Stephen, you had the, the, the model of the contract with the citizen and the government, I think. Uh, but here is a question raising a third very important stakeholder, which is the employers. So it reads like this. Why would you exclude the responsibility of employers to contribute to the social protection of the people they employ? In our opinion, this too is an essential part of the social contract and contributing to social justice. Why would it be easier to close the gap uh, and, and the missing middle, working only from tax finance social protection measured, measures and leave solidarity-based social security out of scope? And uh, I think mm, I'll start with you, Stephen, but I think perhaps Bo and Maxine would like to, to uh, comment on the role of, of, uh, of employers in the labor market. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, I think fully employers, but I think, you know, um, employers have a key role to play in social insurance schemes in terms of the contributions that employers should make in terms of building a social insurance system, which is part of a universal multi-tiered uh, system. That's really important. But but let's let's remember, you know, employers are citizens. They need to pay their taxes. What we need to be do looking at is things like corporation tax, fair corporation taxes so that employers from their wealth are able to pay and that can be redistributed to others because who's building the profits of the employers are the workers and also the people who are buying their services, the consumers. That's what's generating their profits. That's why they should pay good corporation taxes. Goes to government, that's our tax, and that can be redistributed in universal public services. So employers have a very important role. So when we talk about taxation, and I should also say, I saw one other question where people say, well, the informal economy don't pay taxes. Yes, they do. Value-added tax, where you have that in countries, that's played by by people in the informal economy. They're paying lots of tax from that. We have to remember most people are taxpayers in, in most countries, particularly where you have VAT. Bo, would you like to comment on the role of employers? 
you 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 muted Bo. Please. The difference please. doesn't have to be that big. Uh, New Zealand and Australia had mandatory contributions from employers to pensions and and um, work workman insurance and so on. But since so it didn't show up in the public bud budget, but it was still mandatory. So the difference between this type of contribution from employers and taxation is basically just conceptual, I would say, or terminolo terminological. Uh, uh, one thing uh, I would like to point that I agree that it's more difficult with services, but we find very strong effect of countries that had early on started with uh, reasonably high quality universal education. Uh, we have data from 1870 mean years of schooling for 78 countries, and it correlates with today levels of corruption on a 0.7 level. So there is a, and it's actually, if you go to the historical cases, it's very interesting. These reforms of universal education came very much because countries wanted to build a social contract with their citizens. Uh, uh, so I think one shouldn't underestimate education. Also, you could get employers more interested in education because countries need a well-educated workforce. And if you get the kids to school, you can feed them, you can vaccinate them, and you can give them clothing. So I, I think uh, putting some money into universal education, in addition to cash transfers, is also very important. Okay, and uh, 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 now um, I've got a question also from uh, from a speak from from a participant to all of the the um, speakers. How do you see the role of universal basic income? Do you think that is easier to sell than the life cycle transfers? Who would like to start? I can start. I think it's the one of the worst ideas that ever have been put on the table by the left, I have to say. Uh, and I've written a lot about why this is not a good idea. One reason is that uh, you will have big problems with when will immigrants get it. You will have big problems in defending. You have lots of old age people and also families with small children that needs a lot of hands. And why should I as a taxpayer pay some an able, completely healthy individual for doing nothing while we have this enormous need of hands in elderly care and, and, and maybe helping families with small children. So I think this would actually mean a, a, a big, big problem for anything that looks like a, a redistributive welfare state. I think that is an a, argument that should be dropped immediately. Uh, any Maxine, would you like to comment? I, I'm one of the few people I, in my circle who agrees with Bo, actually. Um, I also think it's, um, it's, it has a number of very negative aspects and it really is not going to tackle one of the major problems, uh, which is, the whole notion of work and, you know, just by giving up on the idea that you generate, um, you know, incomes for people through work. This is regarded as kind of very old fashioned of me to say, but I think work is a meaningful form of activity and, and a lot of people want to do it. The other thing is, um, and I, I think this is the problem too, you know, when you talk about a population, not all their needs are going to be satisfied by a universal basic income. Bo mentioned the disabled, there are kind of, you know, life cycle needs that will still have to be attended by specific uh, social transfers. So it does not really solve the problem. Um, and I think it's also a very neoliberal notion of how you deal with social problems. Um. Yeah, I, th I think the question as well was was about you know is it is it easier? I think one problem with the universal basic income it'd be very difficult to sell in many countries because of the the high cost 
anyway, even if it was a good idea, it'd be very, very high cost. Whereas building a life cycle system, introducing, for example, an old age pension for a limited population in, in, in the country, but for which everybody will receive when they reach a certain age, is much lower cost and much easier to introduce. You build the, the, um, uh, the, the awareness and understanding of governments of the benefits of universal programs, and then can begin to build other life cycle um, schemes. I think the, the, the issue around working age is, you know, um, in many countries in terms of benefit, which universal basic income is meant to, to, to resolve, is the kind of conditionality that is put now and punitive conditionality that's put on unemployment benefits in many countries. That's what we need to remove and address. We need to have a way of enabling people to be unemployed, receive support and help them get back into in, to work. And if they cannot work, ensure that they have a decent living otherwise, but that doesn't, but you can achieve that with a universal life cycle system as many countries have done and which have, uh, when, when they work well, they work very, very um, well. Um, the one caveat I might say is that possibly in some very fragile states, I've been doing some work in Afghanistan recently, possibly the things are so serious there that you just need to get a whole load of cash mm -hmm. to everybody in that for a period of time, for a few years to really make, and possibly in those cases, a universal basic income for a limited period might make sense in terms of the impact it would have. But I think in most countries, it's a lot easier to put in place a universal life cycle system addressing particular risks that different members of the population have. Can I say something about costs? Yes. There is a lot of misunderstanding about costs for universal services and benefits. Uh, let me take an example. So I, I'm a middle class professor in my country. Tomorrow, the Swedish government will come and say, we have good news, Professor Rothstein, we are lowering your taxes by 30%. I, and I would say, wonderful. Then they would say, well, we also have some not so good news. Uh, you will have to take a private health insurance. You will have to take a private pension plan. And you will have to pay tuition for your kids when they go to college. Now, what would I do with these 30% of lowering my taxes? I would, of course, have to buy this. And there are very, very good both theoretical and empirical uh, uh, evidence or arguments saying this would in all likelihood be much more costly for society, especially when it comes to healthcare, because this is a little technical, but private healthcare system and insurances run into enormous problem of asymmetric information as the economists say. Basically, the providers have an enormous incentive to overbill and overtreat you. Look at what the Americans are getting for their healthcare which is twice what most Europeans are paying. And most of it goes to these problems of asymmetric uh, information problems in these services. There is a very good economist in London, Nicholas Barr, who has written about this, and it's very convincing. So one has to distinguish between, how should I say, nominal costs and an actual cost for society. So people need a pension if they have to save for it or go to their children and ask for money or if they now pay a little higher taxes to get the pension. The costs are basically the same. The money has to come. Thank you. Um, I would like, there's a few questions that are referring to um, fragile states, and I'll pick up one from, from Stephen Mayer. Uh, should the argument of no taxation without representation be adapted in fragile states according to the source of taxation, such as trade or uh, natural resource revenues versus VAT and taxing? Um, so really different kinds and, and other questions. There are also other questions about different uh, sources of income, but, but here um, actually the natural resources revenues so. Who would like to say something about that? Um, I? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think we, we always think that uh, tax is a bad thing. I think, you know, tax is is a very good and positive thing. It's, it's very much part of how we we, we interact with the, the, the state and it ensures that we, um, you know, that, that uh, you know, we will make demands from the state because we're paying taxes. If we don't tax, then people 
don't feel as though they can make demands on the state. What, what I always find very strange when I do a lot of work is that they, people will say, governments, you know, the government is providing this and the government's providing that and the government is providing that. No, it's not. The government is only a role, is a channel of our money that goes to government that gives us our money back. So we shouldn't really say even that these are government funded. That's why I think one side I had programs are citizen financed uh, 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 as well. And I think it's, um, you know, so we should do our best to really not just give benefits, but also try to bring people on a fair basis into the tax system. But where the taxes um, are challenging, you cover that by putting in place universal benefits so that the main basis of, of, of tax is from the, it, it, you know, the, the biggest burden of tax is on, is, is on the rich. And it's, you know, even in fragile states, we forget to, to, to learn the lessons of history, that we do need to begin to build things that have worked in fragile states of Europe many a century ago and, you know, and 70 years ago that have worked in fragile states, countries like Germany, that was a fragile state, incredibly fragile state in 1945. And look at where it is now. Let's start learning from history about how we built successful states and see how we can do it in a modern context in countries like Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, etc., and learn. And it is about the delivery of benefits but also about bringing people into the tax system, and uh, you know, and 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 that will help push and strengthen democracy because people once they pay tax will demand greater democracy as well. They'll demand a greater say, and I think we really need to think very differently about the approaches that that that, that, that we have. Yeah, coming back also to the point by about Rochdon having the feeling of whose money is it? Is it? Uh, and, and, and then the, the um, money. concern with corruption or not. Um, uh, I have a question for you also, um, Stephen. Uh, if you could speak something about how participatory and accountable these universal schemes have been and the importance of these aspects in building the social contract. So participation and accountability. Yeah, I mean, I think most universal programs really or historically have been delivered um, through um, promises in elections. OK, so, you know, governments win, uh, you know, they, they go into elections in democratic countries, they, they propose universal programs and are delivered. That's very participatory because it is citizens choosing the nature of the government and the type of government, those they want in, in, in government. You go back to the Second World War again in the UK. Who won the Second World War for the UK? The most popular Britain ever, Winston Churchill. Who won the election in 1945 at the end of the Second World War was not Winston Churchill. It was um, the uh, Clement Attlee of the Labour Party. And he won because he promised universal um, um, benefits. So we need to, to, to remember this, uh, the, this, the, this lesson. But the choice of that, the participation in that, was the choice of the British people who elected that. And that's where we get the participation is through elections in democracy. So we have to remember that the best form of participation when we're talking about big national decisions, like big spending decisions on, on tax and, uh, and uh, the, the, the provision of, of, of social security is decisions made in, in by citizens in elections. That's where we participate. And don't think about participation as little things that are done on, on the outside through, through civil society. The real participation in democracy is through elections. That's why we all need a vote. You know? And if we all vote in the United States, we might throw out people like Donald Trump, which happened. Um, Bo, Bo, yes, please. I add something that it turns out that once it's difficult to get them in place. It's not so very easy because you need the elect support from, from big, big groups of voters. But once you have these systems in place, they turn out to be very stable. So uh, the neoliberal uh, governments in the UK and in United States have not been able to dismantle their universal programs. The National Health Service is still there. Social security is still there because they saw, to, 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 to use a phrase from a well-known 
political philosopher, a just system creates its own support. So it's been impossible for these governments who really wanted to, to transfer uh, the systems and privatize them. They couldn't because if you have such a large broad coverage, it will generate its own support. Okay. Maxine, would you like to comment on this also? Well, I just hope that um, what Bo said is true. Um, I, I, it is true in one sense that um, governments do have to listen to populations and there is a huge buy-in in support of, for example, the national health system and welfare systems in general. But of course, we have seen the steady erosion of um, you know, these, these social guarantees uh, over time with the kind of move to uh, more privatization, but also the endless promises that uh, governments make to reduce taxes. There really isn't a conversation that goes on to say taxes are important. You know, they have to be there. All the things we've been discussing today, you very rarely see that in the public domain. Okay. Well, it's not only in the public domain. In one of our publication, we list the endless line of big star economies, starting with uh, Nobel laureate Gary Becker saying, "To boot out corruption, to 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 root out corruption, boot out big government." So they yeah. say big government is a. It's actually empirically exactly the opposite. It's okay. the countries with very huge public budgets, Denmark, <laughs> Germany, uh, uh, Finland, and my own country, Sweden, who have quite low corruption, but it's the countries with very small public sector that has high corruption. And I think we have found the clue to this. And it's exactly this. If people don't pay taxes, they don't care about corruption. Now, uh, I will pick up a very short question from Hervé Kuraugu. I'm sorry for, for pronouncing wrong, but what to do when informality is the rule? So really coming back to the question, how, I mean, we're all talking about how this social contract and greater government revenues and greater government has, you know, how positive it is, but, but how to get there. So, so when you, in the situation where informality is the rule, who would give it a go? Yeah, who we'll start? Well, one way to do it is to create a system where you would benefit economically from going from informality to formality. So uh, this can be done in various ways. For example, uh, we had in my country, also here in Sweden, a large problem with uh, people working in, in the construction sector, working outside. They wanted money without registering the money if you wanted to build something in your apartment or house. And then the government changed this. So you will get a very little pension if you don't pay taxes. It will hurt you economically. And I think you can do that in, in several other ways. So you can make it beneficial for people to actually pay their taxes and go from informality to formalize their income. And you can do that in other ways as well. Yeah, can, can I say, I mean, I think it, it goes back in part to the, to the question. I, th I think this whole idea of informality is that, you know, governments have almost given up on formalizing, which I find very, very strange, you know, the, 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 the labor force, you know, it, it's important to formalize and get bring people into the tax system. I mentioned earlier about how universal child benefits, though, can be used to to do this, but uh, to get people to declare their 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 incomes and, and 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 make a clear link between the declaration of incomes that means you can get the benefits and the the, the receipts of benefits. We need to build that kind of reciprocity into the system. But you can do more as well, as 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 Bo says. I mean, I was interested in Kenya where they were thinking, you know, to get people into the informal, to get people to contribute into. Um, uh, you know the health insurance there they say well if you haven't paid your contribution to the health insurance then you can't get a driving license for example or you know if you haven't declared your taxes well you can't get a driving license you need to declare your taxes you create these incentives but you don't go around giving up which is what actually happens it's this whole idea that the informal economy is a sector it's not it's the illegal economy 
we need to bring people into the legal economy, which is the formal economy, and that needs to be something that needs to be done. And we can use social security and other means of achieving that. Um, and and it needs to be very much part of the kind of a approach to social social policy learning. We had to do it in Europe as well. It was only 1919, I think, in Belgium uh, that uh, everybody started making income declarations. Um, you know, and the United States, I think it was about 1913 that they started making income declarations. And that was the basis of them building formalization of the workforce. So let's not give up. Let's start using it and using the benefits that we give from the state to bring people into the tax system. Yeah, I mean, there are a huge number of ways of incentivizing that. And um, I was thinking about the there's a program in, in India to, um, it's offered to rural uh, workers, farmers and so on to insure themselves against the risk of a bad harvest or a flood. And now these, these are kind of obvious risks that people suffer from and can be completely devastated by. So again, you know, there is a strong incentive to go with those systems. And, you know, as far as other sectors of um, informal workers are concerned, the same thing can be done, you know, through offering a trade-off, you know, we will cover your risks in return, you know, here you have to set yourself up as a, you know, a viable kind of entity and, and de declare your income. Thank you. Uh, we have just a few minutes left. Uh, there's such a richness in the Q&A box and I'm sure we do our best to, uh, or the, the, the panel will do its best to, to, to respond in, in afterwards or and in written. But I would just pick up one because there's some confusions about uh, universal versus targeting. What universal approach does it mean all citizens or the same uh, benefits to all citizens. Just a few words to clarify, please, Stephen, I think. And, and the mic on, we still have. Yeah, um, very quickly. I mean, I think when we're talking about life cycle benefits, I think just, just to go back, I think just to a point I made earlier, people think, for example, that an old age pension is for older people, okay? And therefore it's not a universal benefit because not everybody can get it. That's wrong. An old age pension is a benefit for all of us that we get when we become old. A disability benefit is a benefit for all of us when we, if we, if we, if we become disabled. A universal child benefit is, of course, for all of us because all of us are born. So all of these are universal benefits that we can access over the 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 life cycle. So this is really important to to remember and not just to, to put people into separate categories as if we don't have a life from birth to 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 death, um, you know, but I think the, the, you know, the other point is that what we're often taught when we use universal, it's shorthand for not using means testing. I think that's another part of the element we're talking when we say universal is, you know, if we're comparing a means tested poverty target with a non means tested benefit. It's more complex than that, but often that's the kind of a um, debate as well. So sometimes universal is a bit of a shorthand to say, let's not have means testing as, as well. So I think, uh, but it doesn't certainly doesn't mean everybody gets the same benefit all the time. But for example, in your health service, say the National Health Service in, 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 the, U, in the UK that Bo mentioned previously, you know, everybody is able to access the service, the service itself may be very different. If you're very sick, you'll get a big benefit. If you're not very sick, you won't get such a big benefit, but we're all universally able to access and receive the same quality of service from the national health system. Even the prime minister has the same access to the system as I do. So, um, you know, that's partly the, the also in, in terms of universal, but we don't receive the same. It varies according to our need in, in health. So I think this yeah. is the... Yeah, and, and, and there are comments, of course, about the, the terminology here, but, but thanks you for that clarification of what you mean. Uh, and thank you, we have to close now. Um, thank you everybody, uh, all the speakers, all the participants and, and for all the questions and comments and for socialprotection.org for arranging this webinar. And my final word is just a reminder and plea to please complete the feedback survey that will pop up on your browser after the end of the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to all. Thank you.